Okay, um, the last time we were together on a second Sabbath, you know, on the, on the second Sabbath of each month, the brethren from the other side of the island in Spanish town who usually come, there's, a, there's another f group, there, a small group that they, uh, where my brother Don leads out and um, they call themselves Philagape. Well, they're usually with us on the second Sabbath of each month here worshiping in this um, room. And the last time I shared some thoughts entitled The Legality of Prayer. And um, Sister Julia especially asked me to not do part two because I, I said I would try to do a part two. So she said, don't do part two until we are able to be there. So I kind of held off until today. I'm going to look again at the subject of the legality of prayer. And I am going to share some additional thoughts on what I shared the last time. The truth is that when it comes to this issue, I know that I don't have all the answers. And I don't think there's anybody who has all the answers. But the best we can do is look at the Bible and we can find answers to some things and we can find ideas that are there that give us answers that, that give some satisfaction. That's the best that we can do. And that is what I want to do. You know, there are hard questions. The last time we, I, uh, I was focusing on the fact that there are things that we find very difficult to explain. Why do we pray? And so many times it seems like in places where we are almost certain that this is God's will, why is it that we don't see what we expect? Why is it that sometimes one person prays for something and you see a, an answer almost immediately, another person prays for the same thing and it seems that there is no answer? These are questions that really have baffled Christians for generations. And there are some of the, the, the reasons why unbelievers and skeptics say there is no God, or they say there is probably a God, but he doesn't care about people. Some people have come to the conclusion that, you know, God created the, the universe and then he just left it to run by itself. He created a universe with a balance of good and evil, and then he just, and then he just left it to run by itself. He doesn't interfere, except now and then he steps in to do something extraordinary, then he leaves it alone again. Some have even gone on to say, you know, that there's no devil. It's just God working both sides of a formula of good and evil. These are, these are real ideas that are out there, real ideas that people are promoting, and, and even ideas that are embraced by Christians because some of these hard questions they can't answer. I know I've, I've wrestled with these questions myself. If there's one thing that I would say characterizes my experience as a Christian, I would say it is questions. I remember um, there's a lady from, from, from Germany. She, she always used to come on to my um, webinars and I referred to her as questions lady because she was always having questions. And um, I remember when I went to Australia one time, I was in Western Australia, right where Wayne is. I stayed at a home and there was a little girl and I, I, I named her why and what? Because she was always asking me why and what, why and what. So, but the point I'm making is that it's the way of, it's something I appreciate when people ask genuine questions. And I think God appreciates it too. Because there are answers. You know, you know, I don't think a person who says God is a mystery, just accept that he's a trinity. I don't respect that kind of attitude very much. I don't respect the attitude that says just accept that it's a mystery and follow blindly. There are so many places in the world where this is what we are asked to do. I, I think people who behave like this they make very good slaves they make very good puppets but i don't think they will contribute very much to the development of of any movement in the world and i think god appreciates when we ask questions because the thing is most of the time there are answers in the bible the answers are there but it, it requires 
a little work. It requires work. It requires seeking God to find these answers, but they are there and they are good answers. So what I'm saying is, as we ask these questions, why is it that we don't see answers to prayer more, more frequently or more clearly? Why is it that sometimes we are not answered? I will continue to propose some ideas this morning. While I will admit that they are not a complete answer, these questions don't give a complete answer, but I think they're worth thinking about. All right, so with that preamble, I'm going to go to my Bible screen as I, I try to build on what we said the last time. And probably I will be repeating some of what was said, but at the same time, even in repeating, I think we will get a clearer grasp of what we're really saying. All right, so let me share my screen, my Bible. All right, I think everybody should be able to see my Bible. And um, I'm going to, first of all, go to four questions that I would like to put before us, four questions with four possible, with four possible answers. I'm looking at the question of why is prayer necessary? Why is prayer necessary? And I have four possible reasons on the on the screen. Now, maybe there are more. Maybe there are more. There, these are four that I thought of because these are some of the ideas that are, or some of these are ideas that people will express as the reason. Most people believe, most people believe that the reason why we pray, they believe it's reason number one. Most people believe this. This is a real reason why people have bad ideas about God. Most people believe it's reason number one. As a matter of fact, I'm going to change this color to red because I want to make it an alarm reason. Brother David. Yes, uh, is that Sister Elizabeth? Yes. Um, can you please keep in mind for the people who are on the phone that can't see the screen, so if you can read it, then I can type it. All right, I, I, I will do that, Sister Elizabeth. Yes. Thank you so much. The four reasons I have here, and I'm going to go through them one by one. I'll read them quickly, and then I'll go back over them individually in case you miss. The first reason I have is that people believe it is in order to convince God. Some people will say that God delays and he doesn't answer our prayers because he wants to change us. It's not God who needs to be convinced. They will accept this, but they say it is we who need to be changed. And so God will delay. God will, will fail to answer our prayers in order to accomplish some change in us. There's a third reason which is not so popular, but I am beginning to believe more in reason number three and number four. Reason number three is that we need to convince heaven. And reason number four is we need to legitimize God's intervention, which is kind of like number three. I'm going to, I'm going to explain these a little better. So I'm not going to dwell on them too much now. But I think of all the reasons that I've put up here, I think reason number one is the least likely reason. And yet it is a reason that most people believe in. I want to emphasize that point because can you see why, since this is the case, there's bound to be a lot of confusion. There's bound to be a lot of heartache and heartbreak. There's bound to be a lot of accusations of God. If you believe that, that the reason why prayer doesn't work and that when we pray, it is our effort to convince God. If you believe this is what it is, can you see why sometimes people have resentment against God? Why people say God doesn't care? Because if, if my brother is dying of cancer, or if my, my, my sister is in danger of being put out of her house because she has no rent and she and, and both of them, if, if one is in danger of being shot and, and, and they pray and they ask God for deliverance and there's no answer. If, if the purpose of prayer is to convince God, all you can say is that God has a hard heart. So what do you do? You pray a little harder. You try to bend God's mind. You try to persuade God. Most people believe this is what prayer is about. And so when prayer doesn't work, they, 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 they get resentful. 
and they say hard things about God. Even Christians have known who have lost their faith because they were persuaded that the problem is God. I can't get him to change his mind and I pray till the cows come home and still it doesn't make a difference. There are others who say, there are others who say, it's not that God is hard. Fine, I agree with this. These are a, a step ahead of, of those who are at point number one. Point number two says that the reason is that God is trying to change us, okay? So when we pray, we don't have enough faith. And so God says, I'm not going to answer you yet. I want you to develop more faith. And so God waits. And you, 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 try, you go away and you try to develop more faith. And then you come back again and you pray some more. And there's still not an answer. And you are thinking, my faith is still not strong enough. And you go away again and you pray some more and you come back. What is the problem with this perspective? This perspective is that, in, in a way, I'm going to use a Jamaican phrase that I use a lot. It's like we have been given a basket to carry water. It's, it's another form of works orientation. It's like God is saying to me, you're not good enough yet. Go and become good enough and come back. Now, it, it's a little different because we are not saying God told us to go and keep the law perfectly. We're not saying God tells us that we must go and behave in an immaculate way. We're saying God is telling us, go and find true faith. Go and find faith. And, and when you find faith, you can come back. Then you'll get the answer to your prayer. But, but the problem is that, I don't know, but if you try to, to build faith, if you try to make faith, you'll find it is harder than keeping the law. All right? Because if in keeping the law, all you have to do is go to is, is not work on the Sabbath, avoid killing somebody, don't tell any lies, don't steal. You can do this, even if it is on if it's not from the heart, but you can perform the activity. But what do you do when you find that your problem is that you don't have enough faith? Well, I think all of us have been on that road. Now, I'm not saying that as Christians we should not seek. To have greater faith. I'm not saying this, okay? Having greater faith is my goal. I want to have faith where I can reach out my hand and feel God's hand. I mean, almost literally, I want to have this kind of faith that I never ever lose sight of God and Jesus for one moment in my life. Fine. But I'm not I'm not making this a condition for God to deal with me because if I do. I'm going, I, I, I've given myself a, a life sentence of hard labor. So even number two, my fun. Number two, it, 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 it's true to some extent, but I still don't believe it is the, it is a completely satisfactory answer. I, I lean more towards number three and number four. Number three, the more I have come to understand, the more I've come to believe that number three is important. It is not God who needs to be convinced. Number one says we need to convince God. I think more than number one, we need to convince heaven. I'll explain this. Not to convince God. Now, why, 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 where is there a difference between convincing God and convincing heaven? Let me tell you this. God knows everything. You, you don't need to convince God about anything. God knows everything everything god knows what you don't know so you can't tell god something that he doesn't know you can't give god an argument to change god's mind because he knew everything from the beginning but what if what if god alone is not the issue what if the way heaven operates is that there are other entities who need to be convinced other than god what if the real problem is that we need to legitimize God's intervention. You know what the word legitimize means? It means to do it in a legal way. Now, if you have never been exposed to some of the things that um, we have looked at before, like, for example, the last time we discussed this, if you were not in this meeting, 
some of that, some of this might seem a little strange to you, but I promise that we are going to explain this a little better before we actually come to the end of our, our session today. So those are the four things I want us to consider, to, whether it's to convince God or to change us or to convince heaven, which is a part of legitimizing God's intervention. Now, let me first of all comment on the, the popular understanding of why we need to convince God. There is a verse, or there are a couple of verses in the Old Testament, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Look at what this says. Unfortunately, this verse still resonates with people and rings in their heads. This passage, look at what it says. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. We know this. God is almighty. He can do anything. His, his hand is not limited. But look at verse the, the second part. Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Well, I guess we know that too. God hears everything. God is able to hear. But look what he says. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Because of this, because of a verse like this, most people set out on a journey to live a perfect life in the expectation that if you live a perfect life, that is the condition for God to hear your prayers and to not hide his face from you. I mean, it's an Old Testament verse. And if you if you read if you go back to the writings of Moses in books like Deuteronomy and Numbers, you will see that this is an emphasis that is very clearly there. God says, if you will obey his laws and keep the, his commandments, you will be blessed. But if you don't, God will not hear your prayer. So this is clearly a teaching that you can find mostly in the Old Testament. But this still governs the way a lot of people understand God. And so when they pray, when you pray to when they pray to God for something, they come to the conclusion that I pray and I ask God for something, but me obtaining that something is dependent upon my works. I need to live a life that is immaculate, otherwise God will not hear. And here is the verse to prove it. In fact, there's another verse in Habakkuk 1 and verse 3. Look at what it said. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. These verses are all, they, they, sound, they sound good from a certain perspective. If you're talking about God's holiness, God's greatness, God's purity, it's a beautiful verse. But, if, but when you use it to apply to God's attitude to men, I say that this verse will lead you to a faulty theology. I saw a post on Facebook this week where there was a gentleman talking about what God did for us in Jesus. And you know what he said? He said, God cannot tolerate sinners. He says sinners are so offensive to God that God could not have anything to do with a sinner. And God had to find a way to forgive your sins so that he could deal with you. He had to find a way to to, to get your sins out of the way before he could deal with you. And this is why he provided Jesus. Now, he was elevating and exalting Jesus. And there were so many people who came and said, Amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. But I looked at the passage and this verse came to mind. I looked at the, the post and this verse came to mind and I thought, there's something wrong with this. Because what is it doing? The verse, the, the, the statement is saying that God is so holy he cannot come near a sinner. So he had to send Jesus in order to break down the barrier that he could come near sinners. They make out that God is the reason why, why, why the, the, the barrier is there. Now, look here. Let me tell you this. Let me ask you something. We say that Jesus was the express image of God. What did he do with sinners? When they came to stone one right before his face, Jesus. Jesus condemned them and he said to the woman, go your, he says, I don't condemn you. I don't condemn you. Look, look how close sin was to him. 
Look at the woman that came and took hold of his feet and, and she used her tears to wipe his feet. He was not too holy to mingle with sinners. Look at the, the, the thieving tax collector that hid in the tree because he felt that he was too unworthy. Probably read this verse. He felt he was too unworthy and unholy to come in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm going to have a meal with you at your house today. I'm coming into your house. Look at John. So tempestuous in his temper. So uncontrollable. The Bible labels him as the son of thunder. Look at John. Where is he? He's leaning on the bosom of Jesus. Don't tell me that God cannot mingle with sinners. Otherwise, you're going to, you're, you're going to create a perverted theology where you make Jesus completely different in character and in nature from God the Father. That is unacceptable. That is false theology. Jesus is a revelation of the truth about God. God was never too holy to mingle with sinners. Never too holy to mingle with sinners. That's a false concept of God. What is true is that in, in some places in the Bible, it is expressed in this way because it is being given to people in the context of their understanding. I'm not going to go into that too deeply today, but I'm saying that these are the reasons why people have these ideas that when I come to God in prayer, I need to change God's mind. I need to get God to change his mind. Because God naturally is offended at sinners and God naturally wants to have nothing to do with sinners and he will not answer the prayers of sinners. And so we need to break God's heart to get him to change his mind if we desire to have an answer to our prayers. I'm going to try to explain. I know that this is something that we are, we are somewhat familiar with. I'm not talking to people who are completely in the dark where this is concerned. But let me remind us of something. There is something that we need to always keep in the back of our minds. The more I understand, the more this comes to me more and more clearly. If you don't understand what is going on in the universe, you can't understand questions like this. What do I mean? I mean that the, the background to everything, if, if we are to understand, brothers, we must go back to the very beginning. And at the beginning, we see that everything starts with the conflict between God and Satan. I know I don't need to prove this to you people in this room, to you brothers and sisters, but let me say this. Let me, let me remind us that something is going on in the background. I mean, the unbeliever may not accept it. The skeptic may not accept it, but there is a Satan, there is a devil, and he's alive. And the reason why he's alive is because the issues are not yet settled. This is what we have been studying in the book of Revelation. There's something going on and it's not finished. If it was finished, Satan would be dead. Sin would be over. This world and this universe would be clean if it was finished. Why does God delay? Why, what, what is he waiting for? They say everything was settled at Calvary. Not true. Calvary was 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. For 2,000 years ago, people have continued to die, to suffer. Evil has continued to increase and multiply on the earth. Natural disasters human disasters, human wickedness, strange, godless, dirty, nasty things happen. Where is God? Why are these things continuing? If everything was finished 2,000 years ago, anybody who says this is just blind or foolish or brainwashed or incapable of thinking. It is clear that it was not settled 2,000 years ago. There is still something that is going on in this universe between God and Satan. And until it is settled, we cannot have an end to evil. You and I know it's not a question of almighty power. Nobody can stand against the power of God. Nobody. God created everything with, with his word. With a snap of his fingers, he can wipe out Satan and every evil angel. 
I won't go into it in depth at this moment, but you all, you all understand the background. There is something that is being demonstrated. Satan has accused God. He raised up a propaganda war against God. He raised up a, an ide there's an ideological battle where a propaganda war was started against God. When somebody attacks you on the basis of propaganda, how do you fight it? You know, people have made me think on Facebook. Some of, what, some of the accusations they have made, I realize that there's some element of truth, you know. But somebody says to me, you're arrogant. First thing I go to look at the dictionary and see if I understand exactly what is what arrogant means. I know, but I want to be sure. They say you're arrogant. And sometimes I take a look, I say, yeah, maybe I'm a little bit arrogant. When somebody accuses you of something, they say, they say, they say, I am dishonest. How do I prove that to anybody that I'm not dishonest? They say I'm dishonest. How do I prove this? I come and I say, I am I am not dishonest, or I'm more honest than you. How do I prove it? You can't. You can't fight propaganda with argument. You can't fight propaganda with argument. You know when I really feel really good? When one of you brethren come on and you say, you don't know this man, or you wouldn't say something like this. Yes, I feel good because you know what? I have a witness. I have somebody who it's not me, and the person can testify. His testimony overthrows your argument. And if I get enough witnesses, you are going to be defeated. I remember there, there was a certain forum where, you know, I, I was a part of this forum, but these people, <laughs> I didn't realize that they, they, they despised me so much because I was there, they were, they were non-Trinitarians and I was there trying to make, make some points, but I, 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 the, I didn't realize that I was despised and hated, mostly because some of my ideas are a little different and because I'm not going to quote Ellen White. And so eventually, you know, when I, one person there started to say slanderous things about me, and um, eventually I left the forum. But um, I would still see sometimes some of the things I posted, and I saw where somebody joined the forum and was 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 arguing against some of the things they were saying. And somebody made a comment and said. I think this person is really David Clayton, come back under a different name. But I was so glad when I saw somebody say, somebody say, I don't agree with everything David Clayton says, but you don't know the man when you say something like this, because he's not a sneak, he's not going to sneak around and come in a different name. The person said, I don't agree with everything he said, but he's so open to the point where sometimes it is aggravating how open he is. That person wasn't my friend, but when he said it, wow, I felt so, I felt, I felt really happy to know that somebody who is not my friend, at least my, um, uh, uh, not, not really a, a friend of mine, but he could stand up and make this statement. Now, why am I saying all of this? I'm trying to show you that when people accuse you of certain things, you can't defend yourself. I'm not a very strong person, but if somebody wants to come and attack me with a machete or, 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 or to fight with fists, I, I, can, I can try to defend myself. But when somebody comes with a propaganda warfare, they come to smear your name by saying things about you. How do you fight it? This is what God was up against. This is what God has been up against. Somebody came to attack his character and to smear his name and this person, God could wipe him out with a snap of his fingers. But that would not solve the problem. It would not prove that the person was a liar. There is something going on and God is allowing it to happen until this question is finally settled. This is what is going on in the universe, brothers and sisters. And when you understand this, when you look at everything from this perspective, Things begin to make sense. You begin to get answers to some of these hard questions. Those of you who are with us in our Revelation studies, you are understanding that this is what the book of Revelation is about. That's what we are beginning to understand. But there is this almighty conflict. And one thing we learn about God, one thing we learn about God 
God is almighty. But God is fair. Hallelujah. God is almighty, but God is also good. God is almighty, but God is just and fair. That is why Satan is alive. That is why there is still evil in this world. And I'm going to say to you, it is, it is a reason why when we pray, sometimes we don't see the things that we expect. God is not the only person who is involved in, in what is going on in my life and in this planet. I think the last time, as I was saying to you, when I pray these days, mostly, I will pray out loud because I understand better now. All right, I'm not, I, I, I am not saying we should not pray in our hearts and in our minds. I do that sometimes. But when I'm praying quietly, I know that this is God and me alone. I'm building the relationship, but I'm not making petitions for other people. If I'm petitioning for other people or if I'm asking God for a favor, I'm praying out loud because I realize God is not the only person who is involved. And I'm going to explain that a little better as we proceed. If you were here the last time we dealt with this, you would have recognized that. But praying quietly, it's God and me alone. Nobody can see, no angel. There's no, there's no evidence of what I'm saying or of what I'm asking for. It's private between God and me. But because of the public nature of what is going on, the public nature, there is a need for me to vocally state what I, I am asking that others can hear apart from God. Now, let me illustrate that God is almighty, but God is also fair. You know the story in Job. We're all familiar with it. When Satan came before God, and here, that, that's a part of, of, of the question too. What on earth is he doing in heaven? Why does God allow him to be there? God is having a meeting. It says there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. There is a meeting in heaven and this devil presents himself. What is he doing there? Why does he have a right to be there? Why not just block him from even coming anywhere near the place? God does not operate like that. God's way of dealing with his enemies is to give them an opportunity to prove what they're saying. Even Satan. God allows him to come into his very presence and to accuse God before everybody else. Wow. This is amazing to think of the kind of person God is that he allows this. So the argument turns around to Job. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect man and an upright man, one that fear, fears God and turns away from evil. God says this because Satan is claiming the earth as his own. When God says to Satan, where are you coming from? Satan says, I've been walking up and down in the earth. What he's really saying is, that's my dominion, that's my domain. And God says, not entirely. I have somebody there who serves me. He's a perfect and an upright man. And so Satan accused Job and he claimed that the only reason why Job was serving God was not because God was a good person, not because Job loved or admired God, but because God was benefiting Job. In other words, nobody would ever serve God or accept God's government from, from genuine motives. No, they only serve God, people only serve God because of benefit. Yeah, like a woman my father told me about, you know, back in the old days when he used to be a minister, um, there was this lady who um, was interested in becoming a part of the Adventist church. And uh, she went to visit. And of course, she was a poor lady. And, um, you know, the brethren got together and they gave her quite a number of things. And I think maybe some money as well. And when she came back home with this bounty, her husband was astonished. He said, where did you get this from? She told him, you know what he said? He said, Johnny me, Johnny, profit in there. And uh, that's Jamaican parlance. What he meant was, you should join it, me. You should join it. There is profit in this. That was his comment. So you don't, you don't think much of a person who does this. And rightfully, we are 
outraged when we see that a lot of people today get into Christianity because they're into what we call the prosperity gospel. They believe that by becoming a Christian, you're going to get rich and all your problems are going to end. There are the prosperity preachers who sell this to people. You, you, you join the church, you give a, a, a bounteous tithe every week and you know God is going to bless you and you're going to become very rich and very great in this world. That is straight satanic commercialism. That is not Christianity. And this is what Satan accused God of. He says, this is what Job is after. That's why he's serving you. And of course, what we see in the story is that it is important to God and it is important to God's kingdom that what he's doing is justified. God is really the person who is being judged in all of this. God's government is under judgment, is under scrutiny. And God, it's important to the safety of the universe that everybody comes to understand that God's way is the right way. And what God is doing is the right thing. And God can't just say this. You know, under the system of the law, God says, do what I say or die. There was a reason for that. One day we're going to do a thorough examination of that, but that is not God's way. That is not God's way. That is not the normal way of God's government. God's government is built on freedom, voluntary, wholehearted decision to serve God because we know that his way is good. Brother David? Yes, Brother Cliff. Would you go as far as saying that um, God is a victim here? It's a hard thing to say, but understanding what you mean, I would, I would agree. God is a victim of a propaganda campaign that has smeared his name. You want to know what is the happiest thing about my, my experience as a Christian? After 47 years, the happiest thing about my Christian experience is, is, that, is that for me, brothers and sisters, the question has been answered. I know in my heart that my God is good. I know in my heart that no matter what happens to me, no matter how bad it is, God is on my side. And I know that no matter what happens, like I, I, can, I can say like Job, though he slay me, I will trust him. And when, when we get to this place, and I believe all of us in this room are pretty much there, when we get to this place, God's purpose for our life is finally reaching its fulfillment. So there is this cosmic conflict. And what I mean, the story of Job here, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's enough of an answer for all those skeptics who like to accuse God. You can see from this, if you, if you look at this, you can see that there is a legal issue involved. It's not just God's will. Do you think it was God's will for Job to suffer? No, it wasn't. God didn't want to do this. God didn't want this to happen. But there's something about the, the conflict between him and Satan that certain accusations at this time, it was necessary that God should answer the accusation. And unfortunately, the only way to answer this accusation was to allow him to do what he did to Job. People criticize God and say, why would God do this? Why would God allow this to Job? Brothers and sisters, this is this is, this is limited reasoning. What we're talking about is the security of the entire universe. What we're talking about is not just the destiny of one man. We're talking about God establishing the security of the universe. When you think of the magnitude of the issues that are at stake, you can understand better why sometimes suffering has to take place why sometimes seeming disappointment has to take place because there's a greater issue that is being resolved and it's not just you know brother cliff says god is a victim and i agree but look there's a bigger picture than even god being a victim if i may say so if it, it seems impossible but let me say this if god is a victim if the propaganda against god is to work what will be the consequence? Not just that God gets a bad name forever, but what does it mean for the universe? The universe becomes a place 
of distrust and evil and anarchy for the rest of eternity. That is what is at stake. It's not just a question that God gets a bad name. It's what follows from God getting a bad name. If you look at what has happened in false religion, just, just look at what has happened in false religion, religion on this planet. Look at the picture that people have of God. Look at those false religions where they will burn people alive, where they will stone you, chop off your hand, do, do horrible things in the name of religion because they have a, a perverted idea of God. Just look at this. And imagine that same principle extending all over the universe. And you'll see why. It's not just a matter of God's getting a good name. It's the consequences that follow. So it's a huge issue, brothers and sisters, and, and the, the real joy is that we get to play a part in justifying and vindicating God's name. The true issue is really the question of, when it comes to prayer, I've worked it out to this as being the real issue. Not that we need to change God's mind. Not even so much that there's a fault in us that God is trying to correct. That may be a little part of it. But I believe the real issue in answered prayer is the question of which kingdom are we affiliated with? Which kingdom? Now, everybody on Satan's, in Satan's kingdom is entitled to his blessings. If I may use such a wonderful word to speak of the perverted things that he gives. Everybody who is a part of Satan's kingdom is entitled to his whatever he has to offer. Some people develop this to such a degree that they are actually open Satanists. And they actually see Satanic things happening in their lives. They get some kind of power. Other people, they don't really go that far, but it, it just seems to them that bad luck is following them. It just seems that everywhere they look, bad things are happening. The same principle applies on the side of the kingdom of God. We are a part of the kingdom of God. And the real issue when we pray is the legal question, is this person a part of the kingdom of Christ? Everybody in the kingdom of Christ is entitled. Look at what it says here in Romans. Romans chapter 8. Look at what it says here. Where is it? Is it verse verse 32? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? But who is he speaking about? Who is he speaking about? It says that we have been given all things freely in Jesus Christ. Okay. But David. Yes, Sister Heather. Um, just a pause there. You said that the, the question is really, is this person really a part of the kingdom of God in terms of having to do with the answered prayers? So is it that sometimes you are not a part and sometimes you are, seeing that sometimes the prayers are answered? No. If you are in, you are in. But I'm going to explain what I mean in just a moment. All right. So look at what it says in verse six of Ephesians chapter one. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. I say this all the time. It says. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved god has accepted us but how and where in the beloved there is a there is a condition on which everything that god has provided in jesus christ is yours it is a condition that you are in the beloved let me look at another verse in the next chapter i think it's about verse eight it says It says he has, he has raised us up together. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The question is really, is really the question of, are you in Christ? Which government do you belong to? 
those who are in Christ are entitled to heaven's blessings. The real question, brothers and sisters, is, I mean, do, can you imagine somebody who is in Christ? Can you imagine Jesus asking God for something and trying to change God's mind? As far as I understand, Jesus and God have the same kind of mind. The only time that there was a, there, there was a seeming difference was when Jesus was going to the cross. That was the only time. When he said, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. That was a cry of pain. That was a cry of loneliness. It was not a cry of his will. It was a request. But in his mind and his heart and his attitude, he was just like the Father's heart and mind and attitude. Whatever Jesus is entitled to, those who are in Christ are entitled to it. We are accepted in the beloved. But the question is, whose government do you belong to whose kingdom do you belong to it's not a question of what is right in god's eyes that's not the issue what is right in god's eyes is already settled it is god's will to answer our prayers what is not settled is god's right make that point not god's will but god's right does god have the right to intervene in your life which kingdom do you belong to? I believe this is a great question that is sometimes a hindrance. And I'm going to build on that a little bit more. You know, at the moment, uh, the Americans will probably know this better than most. But at the moment, there is a little bit of a... There, there's some news about a woman who has been arrested in Russia. Her name is Brittany Griner. And this woman is... She's a basketball player, a professional basketball player. One of the best basketball players in America. And she went to play uh, basketball in Russia. It was the off season in America, so she went to Russia. And when she got to the airport, they found, they found cannabis oil. They found cannabis oil in her, in, her, in her thing. She was arrested and she was tried and she has been sentenced to nine years in prison now of course there's a lot of discussion about it america is a little upset the 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 the, the, the lady says the lady says it was a mistake she she inadvertently packed it in her luggage for, for medical reasons i think she says but anyway it was there and so america is upset and they are trying to work out a, a program whereby they can swap one of the Russian prisoners that they have for this lady. They are trying to work out a swap program. But at the moment, she's in prison. She has been sentenced to nine years imprisonment, and they have sent her away to a penal colony. I kind of sympathize with her a little bit because it doesn't look like she was out to break the law, but she got caught. But the point I'm making is, at this point, you see a contention between two kingdoms. I'm kind of trying to use this to to emphasize what I'm trying to say. The question is, you know, it, maybe if it was a little country like Jamaica, even then, I don't think America would just come and by brute force try to take away this person. I think they would try to still do something on a legal basis, a legal basis. When it comes to disagreements between different kingdoms, the kingdom you belong to is important because your kingdom will fight for you. But the question is, do I have a right to fight? America could not fight for this lady on the basis that she never had the cannabis oil. She had it. So as far as trying to get, to get her off this charge and to claim that she's innocent, America has no right. So they can't help her in that way. They are trying to find another way to help this lady. Maybe they'll come up with something else. But at the point, at the moment, she's, she's a, a part of the American kingdom. And so they are interested in getting her out. But in order to do it, they have to do it legally. I'm saying this because I want to emphasize the importance of legality. Even when we pray about something, I'm telling you, if the only question was, what is the will of God? What is the mind of God? 90% of the things we ask for, maybe 99%, we will have an answer 
and we would have the answer almost instantly. But I believe that the other question is there. What is the legal right for God to intervene in this person's life? Even though it's in the Old Testament, you see where when Daniel started to pray, three weeks he was praying. And at the end of three weeks, an angel came to him and said, from you started praying three weeks ago, I was sent to answer your prayer. But the prince of Persia stood in my way for three weeks. There was a legal obstruction. Something was obstructing Daniel's prayer. It was not force or power. Because a, a, an evil angel cannot stand against an angel from heaven for three weeks. God's power can cast out a demon. Even you, in the power of God, you can chase away devils. Even Satan himself will flee. But here was a, 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 something that obstructed a heavenly angel for three weeks. It's not as straightforward and straight cut as we believe, brothers and sisters. So what I'm saying is that when we are praying in our intercessor, intercessory prayer, when we pray for people, the first thing that we need to do is override the legal obstructions. I believe that we need to use the right arguments and we need to appeal on a legal basis. Now, let me explain. I keep saying this, but it's but I I, I, st I still feel that I, I need to explain everything. There are the, the, the issue is not the issue is not God's attitude. Let us settle that. A lot of the time people try to pray and they think that they must repeat themselves over and over and over again. I don't believe in that kind of prayer. Jesus referred to it. It was what Jesus was referring to when he says. Do not use vain repetition like the heathen. Why? Because they think that they will be heard for their much speaking. There are people who believe that the problem is that God is partially deaf. And they think that if they say the thing often enough and loud enough, God will hear. Or they might believe, I see you, Brother Tony, I see you. Or they might believe that God is moved by seeing that we are so disturbed about an issue. So if we keep on being disturbed and calling and shouting, God will eventually listen. This is disrespectful. It creates a bad, a bad impression of God. It puts the blame on God and it fails to address the real problem. Go ahead, Brother Tony. Okay, the question about God having a legal right to intervene. Now, does him and Satan have some type of agreement when God can and have a legal right to intervene? Because we see sometimes that God does intervene on some people's lives and doesn't allow Satan to kill them or what have you. And from my understanding, um, Satan doesn't accuse him when he does this. So, yeah. do, so do they have some type of agreement? Um, I, 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 at one point in my life, I had a strong objection to comparing what is going on to an earthly court of law. But I realize, as I understand this. I understand that the more you can understand the way a legal system works, it helps us to understand better what is happening. I'm not saying it's the same basis, but I think it's the same principles that are at work. Because what, what does legal mean? What does the word legal mean? What do I mean when I talk about legal? I explained a few weeks ago that what I mean is what is fair and what is just. Nobody who understands God will deny that God is fair and just. When the Bible says God is righteous, it implies fair play. It, impl it implies justice. When I say legal, I mean that God is fair and God is just. So does God and Satan have an agreement? You can't make an agreement with a liar and a thief and a devil. But you can make an agreement with yourself. 
And the agreement you make with yourself is that you will not behave on the same principles of lying and, 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 and cheating and deception that the devil is working on. Satan will be a devil. He cannot help it. But God will be God because he cannot help it either. So, so God is fair to Satan. That's what I mean by legal. Satan, even a devil like Satan, if he's in a conflict with God and his contention is clearly there, God is giving him his rights. And although he has no, no rights, he has no legal, I don't believe there's a legal system with rules drawn up that says Satan has the right to do this or that. Satan knows the character of God and he knows how far he can go. That's why he went before God and he says, give me Simon Peter and I will sift him like wheat. That's why he went before God and he says of Job, Job is only serving you. How was he not afraid that God would wipe him out with one snap of his finger? How was he not afraid? Because he knows the character of God and he knows that God is fair. And so he can, he can, he can stand on what he knows about God. It's like me. It's like you, Brother Tony. It's like Job. Job says, if he even kills me, I trust him. How can you say this? This is, this is kind of like a legal statement. It is saying that even if I die, I know that there is a reason why God does it, and it is a good reason. This is kind of like, it, it, it's not really strictly speaking a legal statement, but it's a statement of, of confidence in the principles on which God operates. And that's a kind of legal position, whether we want to label it as such or not. So that's what I really mean. So I'm saying, <clears throat> That when we pray, we should use the right arguments. And when I say the right arguments, we should use the arguments that are based upon what we understand about God's character, what we understand about the plan of salvation, what we understand that will make it clear to the universe, I am a son of the kingdom. I am entitled. You know, what we saw before was that it's very clear from the book of Daniel that God does not make all the decisions. This is the wrong idea that confuses many people. God does not make all the decisions. God is not a dictator. God is running a, well, I don't even want to use a human word, but for want of a better word, God is running a democracy, not a dictatorship. God is running a democracy, not a dictatorship. The mistake is to think that God is running a dictatorship. Even in the book of Daniel, it tells you that this matter, when Nebuchadnezzar was made mad like a cow, we say God made him mad like a cow for seven years. It wasn't just God. Read the chapter again and you'll see where it says, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the command by the word of the holy ones. There are heavenly beings here described as watchers and holy ones who are involved in the decisions made by heaven. Why? Because God is not a dictator. Why? Because God is the one who is accused. And when you accuse God, God cannot defend himself. Whatever God is doing, whatever moves that God makes, God has subjected himself that he's going to be, his moves are going to be examined by a heavenly council. That everything that God does is not God, it's heaven that is making the decisions. People who are privy to the evidence. As, as we pointed out a few weeks ago, you look at the book of Revelation, Revelation 5, and you see that there are 24 elders. And what are they doing? They're offering incense. And what is in the incense? If you remember. So, so Brother David, not cutting you. Yes, so brother. it's even more correct to say God stands accused rather than a victim. He's in the, he's in the prisoners. <laughs> no, I, I, I respect that. But he is the, the subject. He's on trial. He's on trial. Yes. Yes. It's more palatable to put it that way. Yes, Brother Andre, I, I would put it that way. Um, if you look at Revelation chapter 5, uh, let me see if I get the exact verse. Um, it says it says in verse 8, it says in verse 8, I mean, there, there are hints and clues that give you an insight into what is happening, brothers and sisters. It says, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps. And it says, and golden vials full of odors. This word odors is from the word that means incense. 
which are the prayers of the saints. This is this is this is a telling statement. The 24 elders in heaven, whoever they are, they are offering the prayers of saints. Now let me explain something. We insist that there's one mediator between God and men. We insist that there's one intercessor between God and men. Here's a statement that seems to, to, to contradict this, and yet it doesn't contradict it, not in my understanding. In fact, it makes my understanding even more beautiful. Let me ask you something. When the Bible says Jesus is the mediator between God and men, how many of us in this room? I, I see 138. The number says 130. Some of these are people who have more than one device open, but we have probably more than 100 people. Now, let me ask you. Do you think that Jesus vocally intercedes for each one of us? There, there, there are 2 billion nominal Christians in the world today. 2 billion, more or less. Do you think that Jesus vocally, by voice, intercedes for 2 billion people? How long would it take Jesus to even say one word? I know that heaven works by a different time in a different dimension, but even to say one word, even to call the names of each one of us, two billion times. I'm not being ridiculous. What I'm trying to say is that when the Bible says Jesus is our mediator, I don't understand this to mean that Jesus is vocally with his voice pleading for us before God. I don't believe this. When the Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for us, I understand this a different way. I understand that Jesus is forever my line of connection to God, forever, as long as time shall last. The reason why God sympathizes with, well, let me not say sympathy, but the reason why God is able to open his arms to me and let me into his bosom and forever have me as his child is Jesus. Jesus will be forever that connecting link. So in this sense, he is my mediator. He's my connection between me and God forever. God can never forget and God will never ever negate this reality. He is my connection between me and God forever. This is what it means that he's my intercessor or my mediator. Not that he's vocally mediating. Now, what about when we pray and we present our arguments? In this case, this is where I think the 24 elders come into the picture. Whoever they represent, these 24 elders, they have vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. When we pray, the arguments that we present and the principles surrounding our lives are presented in heaven. Now look, does God know your heart? Absolutely. Does God sympathize with you? Absolutely. Is God willing to answer? Absolutely. Did Jesus die for you? 100% yes, yes, yes. But are you entitled legally to God's intervention? What are the arguments that you are presenting? What is the testimony of your life? Which kingdom do you belong to? What does your life say about your loyalty to the kingdom of Christ? These are issues. Not your works, but your faith, because faith always produce, produces works that can be measured. Your prayers present arguments that can be examined. I believe that the, these are some of the reasons when I talk about legitimizing God's intervention. When God intervenes that you pray for some deep-rooted issue and you keep, you keep bringing your arguments to God, we should argue with understanding. First of all, on the basis of what Jesus did, we're entitled. Secondly, on the basis of God's, God's, the legal right that you have as a citizen of the kingdom, you're entitled. This is why faith is so important. If you don't believe in your entitlement, you can't pray as an entitled person. Faith will produce the right expressions that heavenly beings can use to assess your condition. Now, anyway, I know that sometimes when you say some of these things, it leaves even more questions. And this is understandable. David, can you hear me? Yes, Sister Julia, go ahead. 
Okay. So the, um, regarding the 24 elders, they would have been a part of the watchers that you're saying that uh, when we pray, they will, they are part of the, the committee, so to speak, yeah. in answer to her. Yeah. All right. So my question is, um, I know you just mentioned about uh, you believing that you're a part of the kingdom of God. Yes. Um, when, when, when do the watchers are involved in the matter of our prayers? And is it that the matter is related to things? If it is a case that the matter is related to things that is outside of the kingdom, affecting other people who do not believe in God, that's when the watchers get involved in prayers, the matters of prayers to make some judgment. That's my question. Am I too quick? Okay. Um, that's an interesting question because I, 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 I think it's more than just when we pray for other people. I mean, there, 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 are, there are matters that involve the kingdom of God. I believe those are, are yes, matters. Especially, those are matters especially that would involve the intervention of these other beings. Like, like, like for example, okay, I, I, I am faced by death. And I say, God help me. That doesn't go before any committee instantly. There's an intervention. A car is about to knock me over and something takes me out of the way. I mean, God is always his angels. God himself is always there to protect his people. But at the same time, we are, we are talking about the, the, the prayers now, as, as you, you mentioned, that involve the advancement of God's kingdom, that involve prayer for, for issues that are deep-rooted or maybe chronic or maybe something we have been praying about for a while. There are, there are issues that when you come before God, it needs to be known that you are a legitimate representative of, your, of the kingdom as you make these presentations. Uh, since you asked a question, let me just, just point out a couple of, I'm going to stop in a little bit. Let me point out a couple of cases that kind of highlight what I'm trying to say. Re you remember the story of the destruction of Sodom. I want to mention something. You remember God said, the Bible says, so when God destroyed Sodom, he remembered Abraham. He remembered Abraham and took Lot out of the overthrow. God, God never remembered Lot. The Bible doesn't say God remembered Lot. It says God remembered, remembered Abraham. And then he took Lot out of the overthrow. Lot benefited by a relationship with Abraham. In Jamaica, they say, what drop off a head, drop on shoulder. In other words, if you, are if you have the right connections, you will get the side benefits from those connections. It's kind of like that. Um, and the same Bible says that God, for Christ's sake, as for giving your iniquities. What I'm trying to say is that when you're a Christian, your entitlement, in a sense, is extended to others. There are certain illustrations in the Bible. For example, when God was going to, to kill the firstborn, what happened to the Egyptians? Those of them who found themselves inside of the home of an Israelite, they were saved. They, not, not they were saved, they were spared from the destruction. And there are many of these examples in the Bible. Rahab's family, when, when Jericho was destroyed, Rahab put the scarlet thread out of the window. Everybody who came into that house was, was saved from the destruction. When Joseph was put in, in Potiphar's home, everything that Joseph touched was blessed. Potiphar's house was blessed because Joseph was there. And there are many examples of this in the Bible. And the point I'm making is that you can see that the blessing that we have, we can extend it to other people by praying for those people. The, 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 the scripture says, the scripture says, Isaiah 54 and verse 17. Here is our entitlement personally, my personal entitlement. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in the judgment, thou shalt condemn. 
This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, said the Lord. There's no question of this. I am entitled, and when Satan would accuse me, I condemn him because my righteousness is of the Lord. That's where God has put us. It's no longer Isaiah 59. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. No, my righteousness is of the Lord, and every tongue that rises against me in judgment, I will condemn. These are the arguments I use, but also, brothers and sisters, can I use these arguments on behalf of other people? Yes, that's what I'm saying, because what touches you, it drops from your head, it drops on your shoulder. The principle of kinship applies. When Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, what does that mean? It means that when the Egyptians came into an Israelite home, when they were touched by the influence, of somebody who belonged to God, the blessing touched those people. So we can argue what Jesus did. We can argue on the basis of our connection with Christ on behalf of other people. For example, oh, David, I own, have a question. It's, I'm coming, Dario. Give me a second. In my own family, I have people who are not Christians. But I know that the blessing that I find that God gave to me in Jesus Christ. I know that this enables me to become, in a sense, a part of the extended ministry of Christ where that blessing that is in me can be extended to those people. And I can pray on their behalf using the arguments that God has given me of my entitlement in Jesus. I can use those arguments on behalf of other people. What I'm saying is that being the salt of the earth means that God has given us that quality of being preserving agents. So when we pray, there are arguments that we need to use. Prayer is not just an emotional thing where we, we verbalize a lot of words or we get into an emotional state. I know that for many people, prayer is just like, like, like a superstitious ritual. It's like a pagan exercise where you say the right words or you repeat, you repeat a certain kind of mantra or they go through a certain ritual, and that is what it is. But prayer is, first of all, communicating with God on that personal level, fine. But it's also bringing arguments that God himself can use to justify interfering in my life and in the lives of other people that I pray for. Go ahead, Daria. Okay, my question is, Wait, say you lived a lifestyle before where you weren't, you didn't consider yourself or you did not give your life to God or to you, or not, you weren't in the kingdom of God. And now you are in the kingdom, consider yourself a child of God, you're in the kingdom of God. Um, can Satan, can the enemy present any arguments to God or to anyone about what you have done? in your previous condition. The verse that is on the screen says, every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you will condemn. Why? Not because you are good. Not because you never made any mistakes, but their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Look at this verse in Romans 8. Look at this, these two verses. Look at what it says, Dario. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again, who is also who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. I mean, these verses are clear as crystal. Nothing that you have done in the past matters because he is our righteousness. And where it matters, is when you don't accept these verses and you allow your past to, 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 to weigh you down and to drag you back. That is where it matters. It matters to you because of your unbelief. It doesn't matter to God because God has dealt with that conclusively, finally, completely, and it does not matter. It matters only to you. And if it were not for this, I could not stand here this morning preaching because there are things in my past, oh God, I, I don't forget them, but they don't exist between me and God anymore. The only thing I do is thank him for taking those things away. 
and setting me free. I thank him. But I mean, you know the thing that I realize when I think of my past, and I think all of us can can do this as well. When I think of my past, you know what I realize? Brother, Brother Cliff used use a word about God. If God was a victim. And um, Brother Andrew says he was an accused person. I will say of me, now that I understand, I'll say I was a victim. All right, I was a victim. I was a victim to be born in a planet. Oh, David. That I, I, I hear you, Sister Anita. I was a victim to be born in a planet that was under Satan's dominion. I was a victim to be born in sin and shape and in, 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 in iniquity. I was a victim to be exposed to wrong influences from early in my life. What I became was, was, was my circumstances molding me. It wasn't because I was wicked more than anybody else and God knew and God found a way to deliver me. So it, it doesn't matter, Dario, and it never will matter again for those who are in Christ. And soon he will take away even the memories of it. Go ahead, Sister Anita. Uh, yes, Brother David. Um, with regards to repetition of prayer, are you saying that um, God bring at my ignorance in in one um, Saturday night for three second um, consecutive times during that night within an hour with um, between I I pray to God about a certain problem that I had and I went to him saying the same thing didn't know all of these blessing that he he has already given to me in Christ at that time. Didn't know even how to pray what you're saying to me now. All I knew was that was to present my case to God in a way that I knew best. Right? I was saying it to him as it is. And and this was this was three to four different times repetition. One night to God and I got my prayer answered. Yes. So are you Mr. saying now that would you say that God at that time wing at my ignorance. Yes, sister, then I, I didn't know how to pray. I, I, I didn't have the knowledge that you're giving to me now, then. But God mm -hmm. answered my prayer. And and was I disrespecting him in, in in repeating um my prayers to him? Was I disrespecting him? Was I dishonoring him? Yeah, I, I understand, Sister Anita. Um Jesus did not say you shouldn't repeat your, what you're asking. He says, don't use vain repetition. He used a word before repetition. He said vain repetition. And um, then he gave an example. He says, as the heathen do. And, and what, 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 there, there's a difference between repetition and vain repetition. And let me explain the difference. There is, there, 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 there is, well, okay. Maybe the best example I can think of that we're all familiar with is the way people pray the rosary. You know, Catholics pray the rosary, okay? Now, when, when you pray the rosary, from what I have seen and what I understand, you don't need to think about what you are saying, okay? The rosary is that you, you move a few beads and you, you repeat a certain, it can be a prayer or a Bible passage. They, 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 what, one of the things they do is the statement that Mary made, my soul that magnify the Lord and so forth, they call it the Magnificat. You repeat that a few times for, for, for some of the beads. Then you repeat the Lord's Prayer. Then you repeat another, another thing. And you go over and over. Some people pray their, their rosary all day. They go over and over moving beads and repeating these words over and over. Your mind is not engaged, but only your mouth. They believe that by the enunciation of certain words, certain sounds, they are denting God's heart. Okay. They believe that heaven is impressed by noise. Okay. That's the best I, I can say. Now. And it is similar to, to the way the heathen pray. If you have if you have heard yeah. of the Hare Krishna people, they say, Hare, 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 Krishna, 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 Om Ram, Ram, whatever, and they repeat themselves over and over and over. And this is supposed to to, to generate some kind of spiritual force. <clears throat> so they obtain what they want. It's it's disrespect for God. <coughs> it is making God to be a mindless machine that responds to noise and that's what jesus meant it's not repetition it's vain repetition but if something burdens your heart and you pray to god and you feel that burden still and you want to go and talk to him again which father will say to his child 
you have done something wrong because you talked to me about something twice or thrice or even four times. My 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 grandson okay. has asked me for, for okay. So my, so my prayer so my prayer brother David then was from the heart, even though I say the same thing, but it was from the heart, yes? That that is what mattered. Okay, thank you very much. I understand. My, my, my grandson has asked me for something. Um, the, the, give, give me a second. I, I, I see, I, I see you, Nikki, and I saw Nikki, uh, Mr. Hoosies, Brother Joshua. Give me a second and I'll come. But my grandson has asked me for something for his birthday, okay? So he asked me about a year ago or close to a year, and I told him, all right. And he came back and reminded me one time I said, I remember. And he came back another time and he reminded me and said, sure, I, I've got this. And then he, he came back and he told me what he wants to do and so forth. And I understand. He's a little boy. It comes to his mind. He comes to me. He wants to make sure that he wants to talk about it. So who does he talk to? He talks to me. I'm happy for him to talk to me about it. OK, I'm not going to say you have been bothering me about this. Please don't talk to me about it anymore. I'm not that kind of grumpy old fool. I understand why if something is on your heart, you want to talk to the person about it. So let's talk to God as often as we want. But um, not believing that God just is, is impressed with our words. But heart is what matters. Um, Brother Wayne, I see you. But, uh, but I think Brother Joshua was unmuted before. So let me let him go ahead. Hi, Brother David. Um, when uh, Brother Andrew said that, um, you know, our father is on trial, it, 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 it's so amazing because all the time I'm sitting here, I'm thinking it's all about me. It's about my family. It's about us. It's about humanity, our salvation. And then now I, I get this chance to, you know, I, I, I realize that little old Joshua and everyone here have a chance to fight for our father, to represent our father, how we carry ourselves in this world, how we represent him in this cosmic drama before the heavenly beings, the unfallen worlds, before earth and whoever, we, we, we underestimate the value of our, um, our, 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 our place in this, this, this drama, this, this cosmic events, you know, and, and it gives me so much happiness to know now that I'm fighting for my father. We are fighting for our father. Oh, what? what? It's amazing. Thanks, guys. Amen. You are my witnesses, said the Lord. Yes. Sister, Sister Nikki, or Brother Wayne, whichever, I don't know who. Nikki, go ahead. Just two questions. Um, three questions. One is, is when one prays and reading from a book, is that vain repetition? They, make, they do their property, they read a book. Absolutely. And, 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 and um, when you pray, you said earlier that you pray, if you pray openly, it's not just to God, but for others in the heavenly host to hear your prayer. We don't want to accuse you, we want to be accused of praying to these other heavenly beings when you pray openly. If, if, if you pray, if you pray and you address the watchers and the holy ones, I would say you are guilty of idolatry. But you pray to God and they hear what you say. They are witness to what you pray. You're not you you don't pray to them. I would certainly hope that that. That doesn't happen, you know, but um, they are hearing. That's the point you are taking into consideration. I'm talking to my father, but I'm speaking to him in the presence of somebody else. And those are, those other persons are bearing witness to what I'm saying. That's how I would, I would express it, Brother Wayne. But anyway, even though some of what we have, we have shared today, I know that some of this is uh, a little, Sister Julie, I'm coming to you, is a little maybe not not a little unorthodox but i think if you look at the bible you will see that there is substance to what is being said all right we, 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 we probably need a little bit more understanding in in some of these things but there's substance to it i hear you sister elizabeth sister julia was before you okay sister julia you need to un unmute thank you so my follow-up question to what you have explained about the watchers, right? And what you have also mentioned about our prayer through Jesus Christ. Um, 
that he make intercession for us. Like you, I believe that when we pray our prayer goes through him, that necessary that he is the one, um, you know, saying back this prayer to the Father. And if we are in him, we are in the kingdom and we are in him and in Christ, all the promises are yea and amen, right? Why is it that our prayer, um, not saying that we should not pray aloud, but why is it our prayer ought to be um, evaluated by the watchers if it is unrelated to matters or king, unrelated to even the other kingdom, but just matters related to our growth, matters related to the building of this kingdom? Yeah, I, 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 I will. I mean, I'll give you an idea because, as I said, all the answers are not perfectly clear. But I, w I would say this: Do you think that um, even even God will not interfere with another person's property or another person's choice? For example, if somebody is clearly, if somebody is a is a is a citizen of the kingdom of Satan. That is what he has chosen. And he asks God to do a favor for him. If God, if God should, should do this, what God is doing is working for Satan. Okay? In, in other words, there's a reason why in this controversy, somebody does not serve Satan and ask God for answered prayer and receive it. It's not because of works. It's because of the person's where the person's loyalty is. So what if a person professes to be a Christian and his behavior and his faith indicates that he is a part of Satan's kingdom? Does God have the right to interfere with that person? You know, because it's it, everybody, everybody says I'm a Christian. Does this mean that any one of these people who will make such a statement? Their prayers are going to be automatically answered. I think the whole issue is where do you really belong? And that is why prayer, prayer is one of the means that helps to establish where I belong. So I think that's a part of it. You, you say I have faith, but your faith is demonstrated also in the way you live, in the tone of your life, in the direction of your, 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 your words and your thoughts. Everything comes together, which is why God knows your heart and God does not need these, these, these kinds of evidences. But since prayer is a public event and since answered prayer is a public event and it has to do with the contest between God and Satan, then all of those questions need, need to be influential in how prayers are answered. So maybe that's about the best I can say on it at this moment. I really think as we continue to study the book of Revelation, some of these things will become even clearer. And I know that there are people who will violently object to what we, we share today. There are people who think that the only issue is that Jesus died 2,000 years ago. It's done. It's settled. It's sealed. There's nothing else going on. But this is unreasonable and illogical. Something is happening. There's a reason why the, con the contest between God and Satan is not yet over. There's a reason. And I think when you, when you examine this reason, you will see that what we have said today, there is merit in it. 